On September 1st, 1914, an old bird named Martha was found dead in her cage at the Cincinnati Zoo. The time was known to be around 1.30 in the afternoon. At an estimated 29 years of age, Martha was frail, having suffered an apoplectic stroke several years prior. She had been alone in her cage since 1910, following the death of her mate, George. In the years prior to her death, visitors were said to have thrown sand at her in an attempt to get her to move. The area surrounding her cage was plain, with no special ornaments, except for a small plaque that noted that Martha was the last of her species, the very last passenger pigeon. Throughout human history, we have driven a multitude of species to extinction. Everything from woolly mammoths to dodo birds have been left in our wake. Basically, every character from Ice Age. Unfortunately, the rate of extinction seems to be increasing. It may be important, therefore, to look back on perhaps the most numerous species, Martha species, that we have ever had a hand in killing. The passenger pigeon was once the most common bird in America, and quite possibly the world. With one flock thought to number in the billions, the birds were said to block out the sky for hours on end. The birds were able to fell trees due to their sheer combined weight. It was once estimated that one-fourth of the entire North American bird population was composed just of passenger pigeons. Unsurprisingly, passenger pigeons were highly social birds that preferred to live in groups. The birds were sexually dimorphic, with males being slightly larger and having bright orange feathers along their necks and underbellies. Females, meanwhile, tended to resemble mourning doves. Passenger pigeons lived up and down North America, from Canada to Mississippi, east of the Rocky Mountains. They subsisted mostly on nuts like beech nuts, chestnuts, and acorns. They were also known to eat softer berries and small invertebrae, like worms and caterpillars. It is not certain how many times a year the birds nested, but each nesting produced a sole egg. This makes the birds' huge numbers all the more impressive. The passenger pigeon population had long been hunted by the native peoples of Canada and the United States. Passenger pigeon skeletal remains are often found when Native American settlements are studied today. When European settlers arrived, they too began to hunt passenger pigeons, though not seasonally as the Native Americans had. Passenger pigeon numbers did not seem to decline initially though, and if anything, it seems that they may have increased. This may be because Europeans stopped the Native American practice of burning out the shrubbery in forests. This likely made nuts much more plentiful on the forest floor. This may have contributed to the population boom that seemed to start in the early 1800s and led John James Audubon to conclude that they were the most plentiful bird on earth. Modern genetic research suggests that passenger pigeons might have been an outbreak species, which is a species that experiences times of boom and bust in population. Such a boom may have been set off by the arrival of the Europeans. A larger boom caused by more food and a larger bust caused by more hunting is what could have caused the population to completely crash. And unfortunately, hunting en masse did soon ensue. There are accounts of great hunts in the 1870s when there were still billions of birds, where millions were possibly killed. In 1878, a flock in Petoskey, Michigan, alighted to nest. They blanketed an area 40 miles long and 3 to 10 miles wide. Hunters soon descended upon the area and for five months killed an estimated average of 50,000 birds per day. When the flock attempted to resettle elsewhere, it was attacked again and effectively no squabs were reared that year by that flock. It seems that the high concentration and social behavior of the pigeons is what made them easy targets. The flocks were so tightly packed together when they flew that single shotgun blasts were said to have killed as many as 50 birds. In 1822, one family was said to have killed 4,000 birds in one day. When the birds were nesting, cutting down or burning the tree could easily kill hundreds. This period did, in fact, coincide with increased logging post-Civil War, which depleted the available food sources that had been unusually plentiful in prior decades and deprived the birds of habitat when they needed it most. These factors, unsurprisingly, 
began to cause a noticeable decline in the species by the 1870s. Being so dependent on one another, the loss of many pigeons seemed to doom the rest of the species. The low reproductive rate meant no quick comeback was possible. The population went into freefall. Over the years, there had been several passenger pigeons kept in captivity. Audubon had at one point sent several over to the London Zoo. However, they were not common in captivity simply because they were previously so common in the wild. You wouldn't, for instance, go see a squirrel in a zoo today. The three most notable captive flocks were kept by David Whitaker, Charles Whitman, and the Cincinnati Zoo. Whitaker, a Milwaukee resident, started his collection in 1888. Some of these he then sold to Charles Whitman in 1896. The Cincinnati Zoo kept some passenger pigeons simply because they wanted to exhibit native species. Whitman began working with the zoo in an effort to breed more pigeons since they were concerned by the decrease in the wild population. But attempts to breed in captivity were largely unsuccessful. Many attribute this to the fact that the birds preferred to exist in much larger groups, but factors like being prevented from flying around and poor nutrition could also have been the cause. With the captive flocks dwindling, Whitman put out a request for captured pigeons to help his breeding program. The call went unanswered. Whitman, you see, made his request in 1902. The last nest and egg were seen in 1895 outside Minneapolis. By this time, most reports of passenger pigeons were just confused sightings of morning doves. A female was seen in 1900 in Ohio. It was shot, killed, stuffed, and mounted with buttons for eyes. Today, the specimen is known as buttons. There is another record of a male being shot and killed in Illinois in 1901. After that, reports become disputed and unproven. So just the captive flocks remained. By the year 1909, the three flocks only amounted to three pigeons all housed at the Cincinnati Zoo. By 1910, just Martha was left. When she died, there was some disbelief. Rewards were offered for alive pigeons. None were found. There were crazy theories. Henry Ford thought that they had evolved and flown to Mexico, a statement that really shows just how much the general public understood the issue. They hadn't evolved. They hadn't adapted. They hadn't even migrated. They were gone. Forever. Except, maybe not forever. In 2014, the Audubon magazine ran a story for the 100th anniversary of the pastor pigeon's extinction. It detailed how and why the pigeons went extinct, but also included in the article was a little foldable bird that could be set up as part of a foldable flock. The article also talked about something called the Great Passenger Pigeon Comeback. The idea is to clone the passenger pigeons back into existence. Using DNA gathered and refined from specimens, the passenger pigeon genome shall be inserted into the egg of its closest relative, the band-tailed pigeon. When the egg hatches, a passenger pigeon will be born. That's the idea anyway. The team working on this goal, called Revive and Restore, has successfully sequenced the passenger pigeon genome. They have also bred pigeons with the Cas9 gene, the DNA cutting part of the CRISPR gene editing system. It is what will allow the passenger pigeon genome to replace that of the band-tailed pigeon. The group is optimistic that they can have a living passenger pigeon by 2025, completing the process of de-extinction. Amazingly, it won't even be the first time. The process was first successfully undergone with the Pyrenean ibex in 2007. But the resulting ibex took hundreds of attempts to be successful in the first place, and the resulting ibex died within seven minutes due to an unrelated lung defect. The procedure itself worked, though, and it could potentially work again. But some aren't so sure whether it's a good idea. There's a relevant quote from Jurassic Park, a movie that otherwise makes a mess of science. For instance, what on earth laid the eggs that hatched the dinosaurs in that movie? I don't know. But anyway, the quote is delivered by Ian Malcolm and says, quote, Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Passenger pigeons were once considered a keystone species, but the environment has changed drastically since they died out. Chestnuts, a staple food source for them, suffered one of the worst die-offs 
with 4 billion trees killed in the blight. Would passenger pigeons even be supported by the current ecosystem? Could they wreak havoc on it and drag still more species down with them? That is unknowable at present. Obviously, bringing the pasture pigeon back is very different from bringing back a T-Rex. For one thing, it's actually achievable, since DNA's half-life is fairly short at 527 years. Environmentally, there is some reason to be hopeful. When wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone after a several decade absence, they transformed the ecosystem for the better. Passenger pigeons might have a similarly positive effect. They might even help spread the remaining chestnut seeds around the eastern seaboard. It's important to remember, though, that this will not all happen at once. When, and if they are brought back, it will at first be just one bird. Maybe it will then be several dozen. These might be released in a controlled area, where they will likely be tracked and assessed at all stages. It may end up being as difficult to breed a few dozen pigeons as it will be to just clone one back into existence. There is also the important argument that we may have some sort of moral responsibility to bring back a species we eliminated. Humans ultimately drove the pasture pigeon to extinction. Using modern genetic science, humans may have found a great undo button. Hopefully, it doesn't turn out to be a redo button instead.